Hello, thanks for tuning in to the Football and Feelings podcast again. Uh, speaking to Martin Gritton today. Uh, we had a great chat. We spoke about his career in football, playing for clubs such as Plymouth Argyle, Torquay, uh, a few others as well mentioned in there. Uh, and life after football as well. That, that was quite a, a big part of the chat because he, he planned for the future adequately. Um, some footballers don't do that. So it was great to, to hear his perspective on those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I'll post links in the description, as I always do, to mental health charities, our social media pages, uh, and to Martin's social media pages as well. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the episode. Okay, thank you for joining me, Martin, on the Football and Feelings podcast. The question I have to ask, uh, which I'm getting a bit sick of asking, is how are you getting on during lockdown? Oh, I, I, it's understandable. It's all people can talk about or think about at the minute. Um, yeah, going okay. Uh, you know, living in central London is quite odd because, uh, you know, it's a, a lot quieter. It's a lot easier to get around, but um, obviously being quite far away from my family. My folks are still down in Cornwall and, um, you know, kind of a little bit concerned about, I suppose, their health, but also not being able to see them. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of London, I can kind of, I've started a new job. Um, so I'm working over at kind of the London Stadium at the minute. So um, that onboarding process has obviously been a bit of a challenge. But to be honest, it's it's nice to be able to have you know time to yourself to get up to speed. So there's been some positives, um, and yeah, it's London, so there's plenty of things to see and do. It's just you know obviously nothing, nothing going yeah. on physically at the minute. Uh, so you've just started working at London Stadium. Is that would you be working for or with West Ham, or is it a bit separate? Yeah, so luckily, I mean, having Premier League football in the stadium is amazing. So I'm working for the the stadium itself. So we'll be working across events. So um, you know, working with West Ham uh, on certain things, but obviously they're they're a Premier League football club and they, they look after themselves. And we just kind of uh, help help with uh, things that are, you know operationally in the stadium and, and anything else that they need. But um, yeah, I'll be working on events. There's obviously athletics, gigs, various other mm-hmm. things. So it's you know, it's an exciting kind of calendar of events where when we're back up and running fingers crossed yeah how's is that different from what you were doing last yeah like you said this is yeah, a new so, job so yeah I've, I've I've since finishing football and i'll probably come on to it kind of worked hard in to to, to build a career outside of that so i uh, worked in pr and marketing and, and communications um uh, most recently I, I worked on the cricket world cup last year which was a brilliant great experience great thing to work on um, and then i was lucky enough to get a, a, a contract fixed contract with uh, comic relief so worked on the sport relief campaigns that just we just delivered in march so um it's a continuation of that you know in the marketing and communications side of things but um it's nice to be back in a venue after working in the, the cricket world cup I've got kind of the experience of working in venues and kind mm. of the day-to-day um around those the size of those events so you know, it'll be nice to get involved in them again I'm, I'm really starting to see that um brands everywhere I've, I've, they're really struggling for content at the moment i've seen some some unbelievable stuff um completely unrelated to what they're doing sometimes but you know you've got to do what you've got to do yeah very much so and there's a lot of partners that you know at the at the stadium, but also, you know, in the wider context of sport that are just, you know, itching for things to get back. So it was good to have some good news yesterday and, and see that we might have football again in a few weeks. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, yeah, have you been missing football? Obviously, I know it's sort of done in Scotland apart from the cup, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, Scottish football, uh, by by proxy, I suppose, I'm, I'm a Celtic fan, but, the, uh, uh, you know, the day-to-day hustle of the Premier League uh, is just kind of what occupies everyone down here. Mm. So, um, obviously, you know, I absolutely love watching that. And um, I suppose I'm, I'm, I've grown to love football again after playing it for so many years. Getting to be a fan again is, is, is a real privilege. Yeah. How do you feel about the nine in a row? Is it a little bit uh, oh, tough well, to take? Is, Not tough to yeah, take, but, you know. It's it's strange, isn't it? It's, it's difficult to look at those things and, and and try and be subjective, especially if you're a Celtic fan. The effort that goes into winning that league is still huge. And obviously mm. Celtic's position has been solidified over these years. And and um, I, I suppose the benchmark for us was always uh, how well we did in the Champions League. And that's been really difficult for us in the last few years. So there's always, you know, that that pang of disappointment from, from that side of things. But, you know, the team, it's a great time to be a Celtic fan, put it that way. I don't know. I don't, I don't think many other Scottish football fans would, would agree if they don't if they're not Celtic fans. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you might be right. Yeah, I, I'm an Arsenal fan, and I was delighted that we managed to pinch Tierney off of you. Oh yeah, he's going to be he's going to be a great player once he's he shrugged off those injuries. I mean, I tell you mm. what, 
that 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 old adage about uh, Scotland have got two world class players and they both play left back, which is an absolute <laughs> stinker of a problem. But um, but yeah, no, hopefully he'll be a great player in the Premier League. I look forward to seeing him develop. Yeah, yeah, I think he will be without a doubt. Um, okay, so let's move on to on to before you started your career in football. Do you have like a first memory of the game, or when you realised that that you're actually quite good at it and you could have a career in it? Yeah, well, I suppose you know when when you talk about it, it's when you football memories is from school you know and um, I moved to Cornwall when I was really young uh, I had an older brother and my dad uh, always kicking a ball around with me so I always had that when I got to school I realized that you know there was you know other kids to play with which you know uh, it was great being part of the school teams and, and growing up in that never really it was weird I suppose in Cornwall you're a little bit out of the loop in terms of professional clubs so you're just playing at school level you're playing for your local club and um, so I just got to enjoy it normally there was no real pressure growing up and um, I suppose mm-hmm. once you you get to men's football but yeah school memories were great loved it so how did obviously your first club or first pro club anyway was Plymouth Argyle right mm, yeah how did how did that come about because obviously there's a there's a leap there to be made how does how do you get that opportunity well, I went to uni. I went through the kind of normal uni process. So I went to college, did my levels, got into uni, did sport and exercise science down at Portsmouth Uni. Um, and then uh, I was playing for a football team in Cornwall um, that were doing really well in the FA Vars, Porth Levin. So it was a really a little fishing village, but we had a great footy team. We got mm-hmm. to the quarterfinal and kind of got some notoriety in the southwest just through those results because I scored a lot of goals in that run. Um, then I went to uni and played in the England uni team so managed to kind of do well at uni which was kind of a two different sort of routes um, mm-hmm. that both kind of ended up complementing each other and, and helped me get a trial at Plymouth um, I was so I was so far away from being ready when I went to Plymouth it was just luckily we had uh, I think Neil Warner could just left I went to I went on trial and I didn't touch the ball I, I, I was there on trial for a week and the ball just zinging around me and I was like <laughs> This is I can't play this level. This is too good for me. And luckily, the, the the assistant manager Kevin Blackwell, who went on to be you know great manager in his own right, he was really patient and was just like, look, you just got to get used to it, get conditioning and you know practice. And he said we can give you fitness, which is one thing you don't have that kind of day to day fitness of football. So I came in for pre season the next year, next year, um, and Kevin Hodges had kind of come in as the management uh, team then. And he just carried on. He was like, look, come in, get fit. If, you, if you're if you ready, you're ready, you know, and, and ended up getting a contract that way. It was quite a roundabout way because I ended up going back to uni and finishing my final year. And I don't right. think the club the club offered me a, a kind of contract, but it was quite, it wasn't, a, you know, wasn't a great contract in terms of, I wouldn't have been able to concentrate on my studies, put it that way. Um, mm. I could have kind of tried to balance it. So I, I decided to leave it. And then randomly, I... Kevin Hodges hadn't called me back. So when I got, I finished uni, I just found his phone number in the phone book and gave him a ring. <laughs> it, it, it seems ludicrous to think of it now, but yeah, I just was like, oh, I'll just give him a ring. And um, so rang him up, his wife answered and was like, I was like, is Kevin Hodges there? And she was like, yeah, can I ask his calling? So I told him, got put through and just said, look, is there any chance I could come in for pre season? And he was like, well, we offered you a deal last year. So it might not be there still, but you're welcome to come in and train. So I just did that. And then, you know, was lucky in that pre-season because there was a lot of players that got injured. There was opportunities to play, scored a few goals, you know. So the rest was, you know, that was a, that was the platform. But yeah, it was a, it was a. I can't I, I can't imagine me doing that now, you know. <laughs> mm. a, it's unusual to hear a player finish their their full time education. I think these days anyway, because often you have to choose between one or the other because everything's so quick and rapid. You have your opportunity there and. Sometimes if you don't take it at that point, then the whole process could change for you. You've got like the prospect of a future career versus, versus like the long-term benefits of your university degree, right? But how did you... Yeah, 100%. That, and that decision was very... That was very difficult. I remember sat down chatting, talking to my dad about it, but also just you get... you got, you got to go with your gut in those situations. Mm-hmm. Say I was playing in the first team or I was pushing for the first team at Plymouth and I had a two year contract given to me and it was good money. And I was like, well, you know, that's, that's a solid platform. I didn't have those assurances. Um, and I'd worked so hard at uni. Um, and I was in my final year and I was like, Oh, if I throw this away now, but also I was playing for England uni. So I kind of thought, well, you know, I'm in a shop window and if, 
if the worst comes to the worst and I go back and play semi-pro down in Como or, or you know, a decent standard, I, it wouldn't be the end of the world. You know, I was always, my ambitions were outside of football anyway. So, um, you know, football was just a, a, you know, a nice have to and it was a real privilege to play professionally. But I think that kind of helped me. That kind of helped me keep it at an arm's length and mentally was, you know, it was always a good way for coping because I didn't put all my eggs in one basket. Yeah, you hear, unfortunately, you hear quite a lot of stories about players in a, a similar sort of level to you putting all their eggs in that basket and then that sort of bites them on the arse a little bit when they come out of the game because everyone knows it's not the longest of careers. But um, going back to your to the trials you had at Plymouth, how did you, you were young, you were a student, how did you deal with that pressure and what were you focused on? Was it, was it like uh, wanting to get the approval of the senior players or was it just head down? fucking steaming ahead to doing what you can yeah, it's uh, that's a really good question um you're ter- you're terrified you go in the changing rooms and you're just like these guys are all particularly Plymouth Plymouth for our local team so I knew these guys I knew some of the faces watched them on the terraces um and it's quite a hostile environment but if you played football you're kind of used to that so you're just keen to impress um and you're very eager to impress and um, sometimes you can try too hard uh, which is difficult but you get an overwhelming sense of whether they they want you to fit in or not, you know, and mm-hmm. whether the players do or don't, you get it from the management, you get it from being picked. So playing a couple of reserve games um, and you're like, you like, you gauge yourself on who's around you. So, you know, am I good enough to do this? And if, if you know, if the doubt creeps into your mind, it can, you know, I, I, like anyone who plays sport, when you when things are going well, you feel like you can take on the world. When things mm. are difficult, you just want to go inside yourself and, and kind of a hole to swallow you up sometimes. So, uh, balancing those things I was I had no I didn't have the pressure I, you know if it didn't work out it didn't work out which was always a good fail safe for me you know I had you need to back me up so I think that 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 went in my favor and as I said I had there's some really good guys in the dressing room there was young guys that had come through the system in Cornwall there was older pros that looked after me you know there was uh, just it, it was a nice environment to go into in that respect to learn um but yeah I've been in some hostile dressing rooms over the years and uh and you know, um, it can be really tough for someone coming in. Mm, mm. Yeah, I, uh, as a fan, it's quite hard to to sort of envisage that, like the atmosphere behind the scenes. We sort of imagine everyone gets on fine, but it's the mm. same as any other workplace, I guess. I, I presume anyway, like you, there's going to be clashes in personality there. Some people get on better than others, got little clicks of groups and stuff. Yeah, very much so. And sometimes that's what makes a dressing room good. You know, that rivalry that you can't be mates with everyone. And, you know, if someone's fighting for your place, you try and create that mentality. Some of the best teams in, in history. I mean, I don't know if you saw the, that Michael Jordan documentary. I think everyone's yeah. talking about it. You see those those rivalries, the egos, the balancing, you know, that 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 happens very much so in sport, and, you know. Um, you you hope to kind of get on with colleagues in the workplace, but you know in sport uh, that those rivalries can spur people on to, to greater things. Mm-hmm. How did you feel your time went at Plymouth? Because uh, if you had if you had a few loan spells whilst you were there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, again, I came in uh, as different managers. So um, under Kevin Hodges, I felt like I, I was always going to get a chance, but um, but I was a bit part player. Come off the bench, scored a few goals, and um, never really established myself. Um, then Paul Sturrock came in, didn't really fancy me as a player, but also he he kind of brought in a regime um, that was really successful for the club and the way that they trained and the mentality towards playing. I kind of adopted some of those things when I went on mm. that kind of propelled me on to you know my, the rest of my career. So I'm you know I'm grateful to have had that experience, but it was it was tough. Um, and you go from being like this this is a bit this is fun let's see what happens to like hang on if I need to make this my career I've got to knuckle down and be successful so um, that transition and mentality was kind of that was tough um, and, and kind of playing every day for you know the first couple of years getting my body used to acclimatised that was a real that was as, that was as tough physically as it was mentally mm. and then from Plymouth after a few loan spells you end up at uh, Torquay right one of their yeah. one of their main rivals yeah. um, did you how did you feel about that move were you quite happy to make that move or was it sort of taking what you could get at that point. Yeah, at that point, um, Torquay and Exeter are, are the local clubs to Plymouth. So the three of them, you get a lot of players that kind of work their way around. Um, right. So when, when I went to Torquay, I was like, look, I've got nothing to lose again, but there's a good chance here because Torquay, it's not quite the same pressure as Plymouth. 
you know, there wasn't the expectation on the team. Plymouth, you know, had propelled themselves up to the championship and I think two promotions in three seasons, it was, you know, incredible rise. Um, and a lot of the good players that couldn't get in the side there went to Torquay. So there was a little nucleus of us there. And I think Torquay were ready to kind of, they were like, look, we they had a squad that was re- that was really good, but we, you know, just needed a couple more players. So when we joined the squad, um, there was a real positivity around the place and also a different mentality in the way that they played. They were a lot more relaxed. Um, they were a lot more creative. Um, they had some just individually brilliant players. Plymouth were very much a unit. Um, so I enjoyed that element of it and just playing with some of the best players that I'd ever got to play with. Mm-hmm. After so you had a solid few years at Torquay as well. Like I, I was, uh, I was doing the research, looking at your stats. It was obviously very impressive. But then you make end up making a move to Grimsby. Mm. By by this point, you're exclusively playing for seaside clubs. It seems like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Should I got, uh, got a rate the ambition there? But did that decision for you to move to Grimsby was that from was that a financial decision from Torquay? I know there was they were struggling a little bit financially around that sort of time period. Yeah, so a couple of things. So we went, we got promoted up to League One. Uh, the club actually found it, I think, more difficult because we had to bring in some better players. Budgets were tight. Um, we'd just signed Leon Constantine for 75 grand, which is, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm guessing that's still Torquay's record signing. Um, you know, we had me, him, and Adebayo, I can just started at the club. So he, you know, we, had, we had quite a few big players up front. I'd scored a few goals that season, but very much not in a position to renegotiate a contract to Torquay. And because I'd scored a lot of goals over the previous couple of seasons, or, you know, a lot of goals for me, um, yeah. I ended up uh, getting a couple of offers. And I was like, look, you know, this is an opportunity for me to get out of the, the kind of Southwest bubble. Um, if you move up north as well, I, I, players that came down from up north would always talk about, you know, if you're not playing in the first team, at least you're playing in the reserves. You're playing against Sheffield clubs, Nottingham clubs, Leeds clubs, um, Yorkshire teams, you know, teams that have got um, scouts coming to watch all the time. So if you're not in the mm-hmm. team, you've got a better catchment. And plus, you know, every game for Plymouth and Torquay, our away games were like eight hours on a coach on a Friday. You know, it was a lot of travelling. Um, playing up north, Everywhere's a little bit closer um, and you play in sort of, you know, it's just a different environment. Um, so I was really glad I made the leap um, initially. And as I said, when I moved, Grimsby, you move from the English Riviera at Torquay to, to the North Sea and it very much is a tough town. Um, mm. But the people there were brilliant. You know, they're, they're some of my, you know, some of my fondest memories were, were at Grimsby. Yeah, that's one thing that fans definitely don't tend to think about when they when a player makes a transfer they don't understand that they've got to move their entire life there mm. they're forgetting friends that they made in the at the previous club maybe family members they had there um it's obviously very tricky but so so for you did that get frustrating moving from club to club then after after Grimsby as well you spent some time at Lincoln uh, Macclesfield Mansfield as well how do you deal with with that with moving around so often yeah, so again, that probably comes back to the fact that because I was living in Grimsby, um, Lincoln, short drive down the road, so I didn't have to move. Uh, Mansfield went on loan there, scored a few goals. That kind of got me my contract at Macclesfield. So I really only did two moves uh, physically, uh, you know, living-wise, uh, from Grimsby over to Manchester. When I was in Manchester, I was living, playing for Macclesfield, uh, moved to Chesterfield, then back to Stockport. So there was, there was three clubs that I could kind of, you know, get about from Manchester. Uh, the moving is is tough in terms of teams because you're just like a lot of the times I moved on deadline day or I'd move because mm-hmm. I was a striker. You know, you, you your strikers are in and out of of kind of of teams. That's just the way it goes. And you know, yeah. I, if I played if I played for a decent side, I'd always find myself kind of drifting to like third choice, which was tricky. If I was playing for a team at, at the bottom of the league, there was kind of probably more opportunity to play so you know but obviously the challenges that go with that so that kind of gave me a real breadth of experience but yeah uh, moving around clubs it's not ideal you'd love to play for a club for 10 seasons be a legend there you know have successes and look back on your career with that sort of continuity but you know other careers aren't like that um you know and there's a lot of traveling pros that have have kind of had to real eke it out um you know without any success so i was lucky to have a couple of successes along the way yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. You end up making a return back to Torquay at, at one point, yeah. right? How was that? Yeah. How was that going back down to that part of the country? It was great. I, it was a little bit of nostalgia. It wasn't great on the playing front. I, I got injured quite. I, I burst my knee open in in a like a, a game early in the season. Couldn't get back in the side. But actually being around that team there was a manager called Paul Buckle, who's 
who was successful at Luton, um, real driven, uh, great coach. Um, and he had a really great, he had a nucleus of young, hungry players. So going down there, uh, you know, I was a little bit jaded, bit fatigued by, um, you know, I was at Chesterfield, wasn't wasn't in, in John Sheridan's good book. So I find it difficult. And, you know, I was just kind of losing the love for the game a little bit. So it really reignited that. Not It's not always about playing. It's about, you know, the group of players that you're with. And going back to Torquay, you know, where I had a lot of goodwill with the fans, really gave me a little bit of a confidence booster. Um, so that kind of, that kind of gave me a little bit of uh, yeah, familiarity. And my, my parents, as I said, my parents were still in the Southwest. So getting mm. to kind of be not far from them for even just a few months was lovely. Yeah. After after Torquay, where where would you where did you go after Torquay? I know you finished at Truro City, didn't yeah. you? Is that your last so game? yeah, went to went to Stockport and there was kind of a really difficult time in Stockport. Uh, like I, I signed for Stockport for a guy, uh, Ray Matthias, um, who was Paul Ince's right hand man for many years. He signed me and was like, Look, Stockport, we've gone to the conference, but we're gonna do this, we're gonna play like this, sold me the idea. And he got sacked on the first day. So he basically, a consortium came in, which, you know, if you look back at the history of Stockport, it's a crazy time for the club. And the consortium came in and appointed Diddy Haman as manager. So Diddy Haman comes in and goes, Gretz, you know what my plans? I was like, I've been here a day, you know? Um, <laughs> I'm like, well, I live down the road. I've just signed a contract. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm willing to stay and fight for my place. He's like, you know, going to bring in younger players on, you know, less money. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, you know, I've signed a contract. I'm going to, I'm going to get fit here. And if a good opportunity comes up, I'll go. But if not, I might just see it out. So uh, the madness that went on at that club just, again, <laughs> made me think I need to get out of football. I've got to do something else. I was doing a degree uh, through the PFA in sport writing and broadcasting at the time, which a lot of players have done. And it's kind of been a really, really mm. positive thing for, you know, I think the PFA did great work in that in that respect in terms of prepping players for uh, if players want to be prepped and and, and are active in the in, in what they want to do. The PFA are great at supporting that. So I was I focused on that uh, and thought I need a job. So um, mm. Jim Gannon came in after Diddy because Diddy I think Diddy just it was in, it was incredibly difficult for him to 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 do what he wanted to do at the club because of the financial restrictions and kind of as I said there was a consortium that took over that just was a it was a difficult time, difficult environment. Um, Jim Gannon came in, knows the club from top to bottom, and he's still there now. Uh, great bloke. I, I, I played with Jim when I was, I was loaned out to a team called Shelburne in Dublin when I was playing for Plymouth, and that was a, that was a hell of an experience. Um, but Jim, Jim was this old pro that had been, it was in the dressing room, and he really helped me when I was over there. So it was nice to kind of play for him again. I didn't play an awful lot at Stockport, but just being in and around, he was, he was happy for me to see out my time for good behaviour, so to speak. Mm. What do you do when a manager tells you that you're not part of his plans? How how do you react to that? Is it like fight or flight mode is, is what I would imagine? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, you know, you, there's those kind of stages, isn't there? There's... there's, there's um, disbelief and then there's acceptance there's how, how do you deal with those sorts with any sort of trauma or, or, or difficulty uh, initially uh, the rejection was hard at first at Plymouth because I'd never had it before but you use it to your advantage and um, sometimes it gives you the the fuel you need to to go and prove people wrong and again if that's managed well if, if you can kind of deal with that internally and um, you can go on there is an element of it you start to shut down uh, your emotions a little bit so you're like so things don't hurt you. And then what happens is obviously that can manifest in many mm. good positive or negative ways, whatever, but you just end up being process driven. You're like, right, I just need to get to the light at the end of the tunnel. And if that's, you know, you go to another team, you just work hard, generally working hard and lucky having a career where you exercise every day. It's an absolute privilege. So you yeah. get a lot of your frustration out by just doing that, you know, just being out on the training ground, running around, kicking a ball, kicking a player, you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> uh, you mentioned um, they're about doing a degree through the PFA. Before we sort of come on to, to life after football for you, reflecting back on your career, was there was there like a transfer or, or a golden era for you where everything just felt right? Like the players around you, uh, the location of the club, um, the training facilities. Was there is there one era where everything just fell into place? That's another, that's another really good question. You have those moments in your career and it's not always related to the overall success of the team, but Torquay, Torquay I was playing up from with a guy called David Graham who went on to have a great career, but he was just 
best, but just like unstoppable player to play up front with. Mm. So, you know, I scored a few goals, but just being in that partnership was great. Um, the midfield, we had Alex Russell and Jason Fowler, who are, to my mind, two of the most supremely naturally talented footballers. I couldn't believe how good they were, you know, uh, and we were just so lucky to have them. But at Tokyo, we had loads of great, just great players at that level. Um, so everything clicked there. And Leroy Senior was a young manager that, um, it's funny looking back at that now, I'm the same age as Leroy was when he was managing us and he was just, just superb at man management, you know, and just keeping the, keeping the, the team, the rudder straight, keeping you going on an even keel. Um, so that was great. Um, I suppose dressing rooms are, are strange environments because when the team's doing well, like it doesn't always mean that everyone's getting on behind closed doors. But um, mm. I remember we had a nice little spell at Macclesfield our first season there. So we're scoring goals. Team necessarily, we were finding it tough um, in terms of results. But personally, I, I enjoyed my teammates around me. Um, and I enjoyed being in Manchester. You know, I made a lot of good friends there. Uh, it was nice being in a big city where it's, you're a bit anonymous, you know. You can walk around. If you're walking around Grimsby and you play for the team, someone's someone could easily shout across, you were crap on Saturday or, you know, <laughs> you might even want to show your face. But in Manchester, no one gives a toss. You know, unless you play for Man United or Man City, no one's going to recognise you. You can play for Oldham, play for Wrexham, you can play for, you know, Macclesfield. You can, yeah. get, away with, you can get away with just being in, having a normal life. Mm-hmm. And then on the other end of the spectrum, was there not a, not a worst period, but there was there was there a period where the pressure noticeably higher, and you like sort of struggled to deal with with that pressure? Yep. So um, I think it all stems from going back to that. If a manager wants you and you're playing, even if you're not necessarily winning, you just feel part of things. Mm. So when I've had managers that didn't want me, but there was no real exit plan or strategy for me so when I was at um, Chesterfield I was really tough I kind of got sold to Chesterfield from Macclesfield so I'd had a good game against them a couple of weeks before um, and Chesterfield it was a, a really there was a lot of expectation there at Macclesfield there wasn't the expectation so we played with a freedom yeah. that reflected you know the, you know we did when we played really well we were great you know when we were bad yeah it, it wasn't great but we didn't look at the results and, and beat ourselves up about it Chesterfield was a a team with a lot of expectation on, a lot of money uh, spent on, pl- on players that were finding it hard to deliver for whatever reason. Um, so moving into that environment was tough. The manager got fired within six months of me being there. Um, John Sheridan came in and was like, I'm going to play a different way. And the team hadn't been successful before John came in. So it was understandable. He's like, well, you know, if you players weren't good enough, you're not good enough now. Mm-hmm. So that was tough because I was, you know, the commute was quite a long way. Um, so I was driving... You know, I was driving four or five hours a day there and back to kind of just just be a bit part player. And at that point in my career, I must have well, I must have been thirty, early thirties. You you're like, well, this isn't a good sign. Mm. You know, it's not going to get any better. So you just have to find a way of compartmentalizing that and, and and working hard if you haven't got a club to go to. So yeah, that's when the you know the talkie the talkie move came along and kind of reignited my, my love of the game. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough thing, isn't it? Again, another thing that fans don't really notice, the same as people doing their normal jobs, you can just fall out of love with it in stages, which ultimately is going to affect your performances and how you'll see in the game. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. But um, obviously now I presume standards and uh, sort of expectations of a club are a little bit different. But uh, back then, did you... Well, not not back then, like it was that long ago. But... um. If you were struggling emotionally, obviously we talk a little bit about mental health in this podcast. If you needed like emotional support, do you think it was there for you, or was it that show no weakness mentality? Well, that's that's the thing, isn't it? Sport is is seen as a battle sometimes. So you, you showing weakness. Certainly, when I started my career, there was you know that. It's, it, players just didn't players just didn't kind of talk it wasn't like that it was if you saw your mate was struggling you do your best to help him out but at the end of the day you're there to fight for your own place in the team and it's a you know and that kind of environment that's what breeds people would say that's what breeds success now if you compare a dressing room if you're um keeping everyone mentally happy and then the, the performances maybe were better you, you would be hard pushed to find a manager with that mentality back then. I think sports psychology developed a lot uh, in a way that was a positive influence on players, helping them deal with 
performing to their best of their ability. Um, I don't think mental health was discussed in that regard. Um, but you look at what was done around the time I was playing, Tony Adams, Sporting Chance, bringing in those things. A lot of players use that for a crux because, you know, players seem to be very good at dealing with playing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they got to that level, you know, they've, they've achieved the high achievers, but they're not so good at dealing with the other things. So, you know, gambling, drinking, relationships, very difficult for people. So having a security and safety blanket for that, that's, you know, if players could go out and seek that, but, um, but yeah, the playing side, I suppose that, that, that was less so. But yeah, as I said, Tony Adams and the work that those guys do, I suppose, sh shone a light on it and the PFA are, you know, still vocal in their support for mental health right now. So it's, it's good to see that progression. Yeah. Yeah. I watched the, um, the BBC One documentary last night, uh, Football Principal Liam and, and our mental health, mm. I think it was called. And yeah, it's good to see the work that the FA and the PFA are doing all around the country. But there was obviously still work to be done. Um, if you could give advice to your younger self in your footballing career, would you have any any groundbreaking advice that you'd, you'd give yourself? Oh, another good question. Um, it's, I suppose, um, age is wasted on the young. You know, that youthful energy. I wish that I'd, I suppose you look back and you take the advice of older players. Always, there's a reason. There's a reason they got to where they got to. And, and I suppose think before you speak and act sometimes um, I can't I can't be too critical because I always felt that I, I, I put myself out there you know to succeed or fail and um, you know I'm proud of the, the things that I achieved but definitely there's always there's always improvements to be made there's always ways that you can um, you know I suppose uh, better yourself physically mentally relationship wise you know you can kind of really uh, show a bit more maturity in things when you but you look back and, you know as I said oh, it was all it was all part of the journey yeah yeah of course yeah sorry it seems like every tom dick and harry on my road is cutting their grass at the moment <laughs> so hopefully that's not coming through too loud <laughs> no, I, I, sorry mine okay, sound. Uh, okay so laugh after football then you obviously planned quite adequately for it i'd, I'd say from from my perspective but w when what do you remember how you felt when your career finally came to an end was there like one day where you sort of sat down and was like, right, I need to do something else? Or was it more of a progress? It, it was progress because you look at some, the end of some players' careers when they get injured and it's just like yeah. the guillotine comes down tough. Um, or they're just cast aside. Say a team gets, say you get relegated and you're like, well, your options are playing for a, a non-league team um, and maybe you don't want to do that. There's definitely um, there was definitely a progression on my side, so I, I prepared as best I could. You, there's no guarantees, but I mean, when you're playing League Two, you're not on big you're not on big money. So if you can go and get any sort of job, you'll be able to pay your bills. Uh, I look at players in the in the higher leagues like Championship and that, and you think going from the money that they're on, and you know maybe they maybe they've got you know mortgages and payments and loans and stuff and car payment, you know all these and the families that are used to a certain standard of living, just, you just can't go out and get jobs to, to cover that. You know, it doesn't matter what, like kind of what profession you go into. So luckily in the lower leagues, we're a little bit more attuned to the real world yeah. in that respect. Yeah. And so just getting a job. So I, I sat in, I remember sat, sat in a pub in Manchester with two of my good mates and we just kind of drew like a Venn diagram of what I was good at. It's like, right, we we'll write these things down, connect the dots, where's the career in that and it was just it kind of sat in like kind of sports PR marketing you know working with the media um because I had connections in that I had an appetite to go into that and I was studying for that so um just look for opportunities in that that area you start at the bottom you know but you, again the work ethic you get from playing sports sometimes makes you just think so that I'll, you know I'll throw myself into it mm -hmm. so I did that and um you know I'm here eight, eight years later uh you know and luckily managed to keep a job in, in, in the lockdown and get something new that I can get my teeth into. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so then financial, financial flexibility, you had that to move into, into the real world, but quite often the banter and the camaraderie that teammates have together is 
is uh it's relatively extreme i'd say and it sometimes it's hard i can't imagine you'd be able to to carry that into an office environment um like the sort of pranks of players playing each other the little anecdotes that they have just a pocket full of them all the time did you without that camaraderie and physical drive did you adjust well to to what you consider a real job yeah, that's that's another good. That's a good point, and it's something that you hear people talk about a lot. I quite relish the opportunity of going into a different environment, um, but you do miss the cutthroat, the cut and thrust of a dressing room. Just people tearing strips off you if you're getting above <laughs> your station, you know, or just the just the, the lengths people are willing to go to kind of um, have a, 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 I suppose, to create this environment. And do you know what? That is something that um, that you never you never met you never forget. Because it's just it was incredible, um, but there's an element of like kind of over it when you're like getting 32, 33, 34. You're in dressing room with young guys, and you're like, I kind of seen that and done that. You know, you'd find a lot of older players would turn up, they just get on with their routine, they leave after training. There wasn't really much socialising going on because they were like, look, I've seen it and done it. And when you when players that you used to play with then become your manager, that's quite an interesting thing because the dynamic changes, and then you're like okay, uh, you know, it's how they treat the players. And then you're sat in the changing rooms and the other players know that you know the manager from before and you're just like, oh God, this is going to look like I'm you know, part of the clip or whatever. So dealing with those things. But yeah, I miss the camaraderie for sure. Um, some changing rooms more than others. Was that camaraderie, was that a transferable skill? You think? Did you think you developed a, a skill there that you can use in the rest of your life? That's interesting as well. I suppose you develop a thick skin, uh, but you have to watch how you translate that <laughs> yeah. into the real world. You know, it's semi straight. You look at anyone comes out of a, a you know a vocation. You look at I've got mates that went into like fire uh, the fire service or police or you know into even to the actual you know armed services, and you look at coming out of that and it is tough to adjust, and you really have to kind of um, recalibrate mm-hmm. um, um, your your mentality towards things, mm-hmm. uh, and. Moving on to the podcast world that, uh, that you're involved in, uh, the Football Legends podcast. You have that with uh, Robbie Knox, friend of yours, friend of friend of the show as well. That's yeah. something that people say in it, friend of the show. Um, <laughs> so I, I love that podcast because I, I'd i love a footballer's autobiography or biography. You can get to see what's going on behind the scenes. And often I would dissect that with my friends. So it's it's interesting to hear you lads doing it on, on that podcast. Um but do you have a favourite story that you've covered on that podcast so far? Yeah, do you know what? The guys who put the book, it's based on a book called Booked, uh, The Gospel According to Football. I'll, I haven't even got a picture to show you, but yeah. It's it's this book that the Dan Trelfer and John Smith, the authors, they they, they read 150 autobiographies. Got, I think they're up to 250 now. Mm. And those guys are just brilliant. They're like, you know, they're like the the lexicon, the Wikipedia of, of football or autobiographies. They just, if you say a story about a player, they'll, they'll have something. Mm-hmm. So um, having that book to use, me and Robbie are, are lucky. We just get to come in and talk about the stories. I can talk about it from football. You know what Robbie's like. Yeah. He tells a great he tells a great tale himself. So um, some of the ones that we've had, we've we progressed it so we get guests in. So whenever, like Clinton Morrison came in, Danny Mills, Matt Holland, they all tell brilliant stories. So I just sit there and kind of prod them a little bit with, with something that I might know. Mm-hmm. But the one, I suppose, there's a there's a story about a Scottish player called Chick Charnley. Chick Charnley, to me, was this guy who's this... Um, he had what you would call an Indian summer. He was like the best player. He, everything, he could do no wrong. He was playing for Hibs. He must have been about 34 and he was just scoring goals from every angle. And I was just like, who is this guy that keeps turning up? And he'd score against all the big, he'd score against Rangers and Celtics, which always kind of gets notoriety for any of the teams outside of that top two. Um, and he was a brilliant player. So me and my mates used to talk about him. Anyway, when we did the Football Legends and the guys dug up this story on him, which was insane. It involves a manager, a pigeon, a team talk, um, and I, I think it was a Man United goalkeeper at the time, but yeah, I would urge people to go and have a listen. Um, they're only a short podcast, only like 10 minutes long, so you can have a little listen, and, and if you don't like it, move on to the next one. But yeah, the Chick Charnley story is something else, and I'd, I'd rather not repeat it here because it's probably, yeah, the RSPCA might go into <laughs> All right, oh, uh, there'll be a link in the description for anyone listening. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, 
I have a, a few questions before we before we sort of round this round this up. Uh, do you get stressed easy? Um, it's that's funny actually. I, I suppose in this in my new job, it's. Uh, or eat any jobs I've done after football, um, dealing with stress, it's very different. As I said, you know, being out on the pitch was great because you just get out of your system, mm. you know? It's much worse. It's much worse for being like a, a family member of a player. If they've had a bad game, you're like, oh, you know, I feel bad for you. So that, you know, when you played, you didn't go out to have a bad game, but at least you got out of your system. Yeah. And you gen- generally, it helps you deal with things. So that always helped me deal with stress. Um, I think I'm better at dealing with stress than, than when I first came out of football, that's for sure. Um, it's generally based on your experiences and knowledge of a subject that helps you be calm, helps you deal with things. So dealing with things for the first time outside of football was, was a challenge. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think I'm okay with dealing with it now. Mm-hmm. Uh, what makes you happy? Oh, do you know what? The lockdown's really made me um, happy. The, the simplicity of sitting with a few mates in a pub, just having a good yarn. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't even have to be in a pub. It could be anywhere, but yeah. Um, yeah, having having a laugh and a good story um, is something that, that I miss. It's something that makes me very happy. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I'm, I'm the same there. Uh, and also across um, the Football and Feeling social media pages, because there's not been any football to sort of document really, uh, I've been sort of reliving emotional moments in the game, whether it's good or bad. Um, so if, throughout your career, is there a moment that you'd consider to be the most emotional Again, one for good and one for bad. Sure. Uh, Torquay, and it was 20 years ago. Was it 20 years ago? No, sorry, 16 years ago. 16 years ago, just the week gone by, we, we got promoted on the last day of the season on goal difference um, away at South End. And it was, in, so we went, we were the third team to go up. And in Torquay's terms, that we still had an open top bus tour for coming third in League Two. <laughs> so like, so that an open top bus. That feeling of getting promoted when really we kind of snatched it. We snatched that away from Huddersfield on the last day of the season. On their, They had their team bus and they were like, we're going up in Champagne. But we nicked it from them. And, you know, and credit to Huddersfield because they went up through the playoffs, having that disappointment on the last day of the season and then going up. But that week of just, I don't think I took my talkie track suit off. I think <laughs> the team, we, just, we were out and about having a drink. We we're out having a laugh. We we're around each other's houses. We were still like kind of... Com- just pinching ourselves, the feeling of achievement um, kind of meant so much more. It's, it meant so much more at Torquay because it, it felt like we couldn't do it or we weren't expected to do it. Um, so doing that, achieving that was, yeah, that was the greatest. Um, maybe a, a, a bad one or not, a, a, like a, I suppose a more negative one. Um, I suppose the feeling of getting told that you're not good enough. So, you know, Plymouth first time around, looking at, going back down to Como and just being like, oh, I might have to play non-league again or do I want to keep playing? What do I want to do? You know, and then obviously you can kind of process that and realise, look, it's not the end of the world, you get over it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, being told you're not good enough at, when you when you feel bulletproof at that age is always, uh, can be a bit earth shattering. So, um, you know, getting over that was, was uh, took, a, took a bit of time, but we got there in the end. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and the last question, I always like to end on a bit of positive reflection. Um, what about yourself are you most proud of? Oh, um, that is a good question. Um, I definitely, I, I'd say life after football. So perhaps pride wasn't, pride was, you know, getting my degree uh, uh, initially for the first time around and then coming out of football and, you know, being able to make a success in my career, I suppose it's a different sort of pride. As I said, football, you have great moments. Everything's quantifiable, but it's just sport. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you get over it, you move on to the next season. Um, uh, yeah, achieving a, a profession outside of football is, is something I'm proud of and, you know, um, keen to keep building. Mm-hmm. Amazing stuff. Thank you very much, Martin, for joining me. Um, where can people find you if they want to if they want to satisfy oh, your social media well, needs? Twitter. Twitter definitely mainly just for football, uh, um, just for football updates, podcasts, various other things. So yeah, probably the best place to get hold of me and uh, uh, and let me know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people aren't shy about that on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Okay, thanks again, Martin, and thank you for tuning in to the Football and Feelings podcast. Cheers. <laughs>